Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lake of the Woods Church. We are delighted to, to be with you electronically this morning. My name is John Howe. I'm the senior pastor. This is Adam Colson, our senior associate, and Jordan Metis, our associate pastor. And it's just a delight to, to join you week by week. I want to begin with some words from the 19th Psalm. David said, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. We so often think of, of the, the law, the word of God as being kind of like a straitjacket telling us what to do. Uh, David especially understood that, that that was all for our own good. And as we walk in the way that the Lord has ordained, that's where we're going to find his blessing and his joy. So... I wanted to share a couple of things with you this morning, but but first, Adam, this has been an amazing week for you and Johanna <laughs> it has. in it's the midst a, of moving, and then they change uh, your dates and everything. Yes, yeah, we're in the midst of a move. We're, 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 we're downsizing, from, downsizing. From, from a bigger home to a little bit smaller home. Of course, our son's in college now, and our daughter's uh, beginning to, to look at colleges, and another year she'll be going to college, so it's a good time for us to... To do that, but uh, yeah, this has been a crazy week of packing and getting ready and, and getting rid of stuff and moving stuff. So. Yeah, but you were originally not going to move until right, tomorrow, right? Monday, are you right? Monday, tomorrow, we were going to be moving. But then you've actually done it mostly yes. on Friday. Yes, because wow. of the rain coming in uh, <laughs> that was scheduled, so we ended up the date got moved up, and we weren't we weren't necessarily prepared for that. Right. But but hey, it, it but happens. you're coping. We're coping. Yeah, you yes. gave up sleep for Lent. I right? did. Yeah. I Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to share with you, um, we have uh, here at Lake of the Woods Church a uh, faith-based cancer support ministry that we call Walk with Hope. Mm -hmm. It's a support group for people going through cancer and for their caregivers. Uh, we've had a women's group that's been meeting for about three years, and we're now starting up a men's group, which will be run concurrently by Minister Mike LeMay. Uh, the groups all both meet on the third Tuesday of the month, and they're currently meeting on Zoom. So if that's something that might be of interest to you, go to our website, and you'll, you'll see all the information there, lowchurch.org. Um, also wanted to mention that we have begun a um, Lenten series as of last Wednesday evening on the Psalms. And uh, that will be available also on our website uh, as of tomorrow, lowchurch.org. It's, it's not a devotional study of the Psalms. It's more uh, how they were written and how to understand them, how to appropriately interpret them. And I'm trying to give you some handles to make your study and your use of the Psalms uh, uh, easier and, and, and uh, more in-depth for your understanding. So we're, we're into Lent, and we're already looking toward Easter. We have a very full Easter program planned. Would you just tell us a little bit about what, what that will entail? I'd be happy to. Thank Believe you, it or not, Easter is, is right around the corner. Yeah. And so we're going to have four services, four in-person services Easter morning, uh, a sunrise service out on the Clubhouse Point, which will move inside if the weather uh, is not good that morning. So what we'll time have, should people be there for that? Probably about 7 a.m. to be ready. Um, so we have that service. And then in the church, we'll have an 8.30 service, 9.45, uh, and an 11 a.m. service. And at right, right now, we're requesting that people register for those or sign up for those. And those signups are on lowchurch.org as well. We want to be sure we don't exceed the uh, space uh, limitations. So that's why we're asking you to sign up for those services. But if you're in the area, we sure hope you can join us for, for one or another of them. Our ministry partner this, this month... Yes, our, our ministry partner for this month is um, actually serving in one of the countries that there's great persecution of, of believers. And so we have to be careful about we do. confidentiality, Absolutely, but we're praying for 
We are. So what we'll be doing is we'll be talking there in our, our, our Church on the Move segment today. We'll be talking about the country in general, how to pray for that country, pray for the missionary without using the missionary. Exactly. Name. Good. Yeah. So thank you for joining us. We have a wonderful program this morning, and uh, it's all to the glory of God. As we mentioned earlier, our mission partner this month uh, serves in a country where there's great persecution. And I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about the country of India where they serve. India is a country that is rich with heritage and tradition. There's over 1.2 billion people living there and it's actually the second most populated country in the world. There are 2,500 different people groups in India, speaking over 456 different languages. So you can see the ministry and the mission there is very important and very diverse. The economy is split largely between the elite upper class and an oppressed lower class. And, and middle class is beginning now to, to start to form and flourish. And, and this caste system continues to divide people. Although it's illegal, Discrimination and violence against those lower class people is commonplace and great discrimination against Christians is taking place. In fact, Open Doors and Voice of the Martyrs have both, both risen India to the top of the list as one of the countries where, it's the, where there's the greatest persecution against believers. 
This month we want to pray that the people of India will come to see how precious and valuable each person is. Here's some prayer points that you can pray about this month. Pray for the culture barriers of the caste system, that they will be overcome by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for the good news of Jesus to reach every village in town. Pray for justice and hope in a nation that's been plagued by oppression, poverty, and disease. And last, pray for our missionaries, for the heralds of the gospel that are taking the good news of Jesus in spite of the dangers, the difficulties, and the persecution. They're taking the good news of Jesus. And praise God, India, although it's been risen as one of the greatest persecuting nations, is also rising as one of the nations where there is more converts. The fastest growing number of converts in the world is taking place in India. Pray for our mission partners. Pray for the people of India. Pray that the gospel of Christ will continue to penetrate the hearts of the people and change that nation. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, as we move more deeply into this Lenten season, we're mindful that you sent your servants, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Lord, there's a stirring within our church, a hunger to know you more deeply and to see you working more mightily among us. So we dare to ask you to show us your truth and give us the courage to obey it. Where in anything we have erred, correct us. Where we've gone astray, redirect our steps. Help us to, to mend broken relationships Give us compassion toward any who offend us and let our conversations be pleasing to you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Visit us with signs and wonders, gifts of healing and blessing. We bring before you those in this congregation and those in our families who need your touch, your healing, your guidance, in any specific way. Let's, let's mention them now by name. Lord, we pray for the leaders of our nation. Cause them to seek your face and turn from any policies or practices that bring harm instead of good. We pray especially for those who name your name and seek your face. And do them with the spirit of wisdom and enlarge their leadership, that there may be peace and justice here at home, and that we may be a blessing to the other nations of the earth. Gracious Father, we pray for our missionary partners in India this month. We ask for protection as they minister in the face of great persecution. Change the hearts and transform the lives of those among whom they serve. Guide your people to support their work of making Christ known that he may draw many to himself. And finally, Lord, we ask your blessing on your servant, Pastor Jordan Medes, as he shares with us the good things you've shown him in your word. Give him great joy as he proclaims your good news. We pray all these things in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temp into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from John's gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, 
a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for the people of God. Few passages in the Bible have seen the sort of attention that John 3, 1 through 17 receive. Along with the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, John chapter 3 is one of the best-known passages of Scripture. John 3.16 is arguably the most memorized verse in all of Scripture. And before COVID took fans out of stadiums, you could hardly watch a sporting event without seeing a poster flashing John 3.16. Athletes commonly use eye black under their eyes to reduce the glare of sunlight and bright stadium lights. And many athletes have the verse address, John 3.16, printed on that eye black. Few passages are used in evangelism as much as John 3 and Jesus' explanation of the need to be reborn. Chuck Colson, also known as Richard Nixon's hatchet man, famously said he would walk over his grandmother's grave if he needed to. Colson ended up going to prison for his involvement in the Watergate conspiracy. And it was in prison he became a Christian. And when he published the story of his conversion, he titled the book, Born Again. Some people assumed he had picked up Baptist terminology. Colson said he had borrowed the phrase from his wife's Roman Catholic missal. Without even cracking open the book, we can assume that John 3 plays a large role in Colson's book that has helped many make the decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. These verses detail God's love for all people and the importance of true faith and conversion. They've been studied at great lengths to understand every word and nuance John has written. For example, in verse 8, Jesus creatively uses the Greek word pneuma for wind. The wind blows where it chooses. Pneuma can mean wind or breath or spirit. So in other words, the spirit blows where it chooses. Jesus is very intentional with his use of the word. And it's meant to paint a clearer picture of Jesus' meaning of the work of the Holy Spirit. And while the Apostle Paul is most known for his lengthy sermons and speeches to unbelievers, primarily an unbelieving Greco-Roman audience, I love how in this episode, John illustrates Jesus' 
simply having a conversation with Nicodemus, a religious leader who was one who was already supposedly in with God. Now, we may not all get the opportunity to preach to a large congregation or speak at a Christian conference in front of thousands or evangelize in a tent revival or maybe even make videos that reach millions on YouTube. But we all have the opportunity to have a conversation. And this conversation with Nicodemus is a model conversation. An example of Jesus, the light of the world, bringing the light to one who is in the dark, both physically and spiritually. Nicodemus is not just a literary figure that John uses to make a point. Nicodemus was a real person, a true historical figure we can look up in history books. Nicodemus was a learned man seeking the truth. Or Nicodemus perhaps knows the truth but is afraid of fully believing for fear of being put out of the synagogue or being ridiculed by his friends. So he comes at night. Nicodemus perhaps wants to believe, but not at any cost to himself. His position, his stature, his possessions, or even his pride. Nicodemus wasn't just a man. He's all of us. He's each one of us. He's someone we know. He's someone in our own family. And Jesus has already piqued Nicodemus' interest through his life and teaching. So for us, this is why life uh, or living a life of integrity is so vital for our witness. So the question needs to be asked, asked, Does our life, our speech, or even our social media presence invite someone to ask the question, to ask the questions about Jesus and extend an invitation to have a conversation? In John's gospel, this conversation takes up several verses, and we can read it in a few minutes. However, we have to see this conversation as one that probably lasted a while. It took some time. It took investment, perhaps even all night. And what I perhaps love most about this conversation is how open, honest, and unedited the conversation is. Nicodemus starts, Jesus, I've seen the miracles. I've heard you teach. You must be from God, right? Just, just, Just tell me. Is it true? Jesus responds, yes, you're right. But to truly see God's kingdom, you must be born from above. And here we see another example of Jesus' wordplay. From above in Greek, anothen, also means again, where we get the idea of being born again. So Jesus is saying how much you must be both born again and born from above. Nicodemus still doesn't quite get it. Wait, so I have to go back into my mother's womb and be reborn? Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell you that no one can enter God's kingdom without being born of water and spirit. Herein lies another area of study. The combination of water and spirit is a reference to God's renewal. Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, demonstrating the need to be reborn of the Holy Spirit and through baptism. Nicodemus then says, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm still confused here. Born of water and spirit? Jesus, what are you talking about? Jesus replies, Are you a teacher of Israel? If you have trouble understanding the earthly things, how can you understand the spiritual things? You need the aid of the Holy Spirit. 
So let me put it this way. Using a story you know. Using the story of Moses putting a serpent on a pole. And so let's, you and I, do that this very morning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. It reads, From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. God commanded Moses to lift a serpent on a pole. The very problem the Israelites had being bitten by snakes and called them to gaze at it. That is in the physical. And in like manner, the Son of Man will be lifted up on a pole who for our sake became sin. This is the spiritual In both instances, the problem, snake or sin, is lifted high, and because we believe, we live. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't it beautiful how God meets us where we are? to take us where he wants us. As Dr. Howe reminded us last week, when the Bible uses the words life and death, it is speaking of spiritual realities, not biological life and death. And this conversation with Nicodemus is a model conversation for us as an example to us and for us. An example to help us in our lives to move from the physical to the spiritual, but also an encouragement for us to move in the everyday conversations of life from the physical to the spiritual. Because God so loved the world, he wants us to believe and live. And not only is this conversation intended to elevate our thinking from the facts of Jesus' life to the truth that he is God, But it's an example for the way we are supposed to have those open, honest, and and, and unedited conversations in our life and not be afraid to have them and make the transition to the spiritual realm. In our Saturday morning men's group, we're in the middle of a study entitled Gospel Fluency. And the intent of this study is to help us see God in every situation and have those conversations with our spouses Uh, with our families, with our friends, and have those conversations about God's work in the everyday and to see God in everything. One of my textbooks in evangelism class in seminary was called Share Jesus Without Fear by William Fay. And I know the teens use this in their training for missions work. And in his book, Faye details that it takes an average of 7.6 times for someone to hear the gospel before they receive it. But how do we know if someone has heard the gospel 7.6 times? We find out through conversations. We share our testimony. We share what we believe God is doing in our life today. We share what God has done in our life previously. 
and we share our hopes for the future. His will be done. We have coffee together. We FaceTime together. Maybe we Zoom with each other. We live life together. And then with the Holy Spirit's prompting, we take that leap of faith. We transition the conversation from the physical to the spiritual. And historically, this transition has taken the form of, do you believe you're going to heaven or to hell? And and while this question is theologically correct, it may or may not be the proper transition. Only the Holy Spirit can answer that. After all, Jesus didn't say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're going to hell. Believe in me or you're going to hell. Jesus instead invites Nicodemus. He invites Nicodemus in to have a conversation and with the Spirit's leading, makes that transition. William Fay gives the example of asking someone, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And with that question, you can kind of get a baseline of a person's beliefs. And then maybe ask a follow-up question. Maybe the question of, what do you think about Jesus Christ? Who do you think he is? And by taking our conversations into the spiritual realm, we take our hands off the wheel and we let the Holy Spirit take over. And this is why it's so important that we have these conversations with our children and in our homes. Because the walls that the world has us build up as we grow older, they're not there. They're not there in the younger generations. So I ask you, do you take those conversations to the spiritual realm with your family and in your homes? Do you look for God in every situation? And do you talk about him when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise? Because Jesus encourages us to have the conversation. And while for those who believe, This passage illustrates the kinds of conversations we're encouraged to have with others. The ultimate thrust of this passage and all of John's gospel is to believe that we would all see the truth of Jesus Christ so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Not just flesh and blood, but a right relationship with God. Nicodemus demonstrates that we can have all the knowledge and all the proof of the truths of the Bible and still not believe. We can ask all the questions about the historicity of Jesus, and we certainly should. But do you believe? It's entirely possible to have your theology, your philosophy, your history, and your archaeology all right, all of which point to the truth of Jesus, the Messiah, I might add. It's possible to have all of those right, however, have your relationship all wrong. Nicodemus was a theologian. I'm a theologian. Believe it or not, You are a theologian. But Nicodemus didn't believe. We all have an idea who God is. And maybe we can quote scripture and analyze scripture with the best of them. But do we believe? Gary Burge, a professor at Calvin uh, Theological Seminary, tells the story of how he was leading a group of students through the Holy Land. Their guide was a Jewish man named Moshe. And Moshe could provide a beautiful five-century history of Capernaum and tell virtually every story and teaching Jesus told in that lakeside village. And so Professor Burge asked Moshe, what do you think about the truth of Jesus' words? Moshe responded, Jesus' words are interesting, but I'm a Jew, 
And that's where I'm comfortable. Moshe was happy being comfortable. He knew all about Jesus, but had not surrendered and believed to be born again, born from above, even if it meant being uncomfortable. God did not send a messenger, Jesus, to do the dirty work. God himself went to the cross. So must the Son of Man be lifted up on our behalf in order to bring creation back to himself. For in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Do you believe this? Have you been reborn? A few days ago, my kids were putting our chickens to bed. Yes, we put our chickens to bed. The chickens have a spot in the shed where there's hay, food, and water. And there's even a little space heater for them for when it gets really cold outside. And as the kids were putting the chickens away, they yelled, Dad, there's a possum in the chicken coop. He ran away from us, and now he's caught in the netting above the coop. You see, we have netting above the chicken coop that keeps hawks from flying down and trying to catch the chickens and attack the chickens. So I ran down to see what was going on. And sure enough, this huge possum had run away from the kids and got himself entangled in the netting. And as I tried to get closer to investigate, this possum revealed just how big his teeth were and he revealed just how much of a fight he was going to put up if I got any closer. Now, and I realized that many would probably say to just to kill him because it would have just been easier. But we don't kill animals at our house unless it's absolutely necessary. And I didn't have a pole saw or anything to, to try to release him from a distance. So I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and I began cutting each piece of netting, gently sliding the knife between the scared and angry possum and the netting, and then turning the blade out to cut through each nylon strand to free him. After several minutes and carefully working through each strand, the possum was free. But the odd thing was, he didn't run. He didn't know he was free. He didn't believe he was free. And so he just sat there for a while looking at me and I looking at him. And as I looked at him, I looked at him with happiness inside because I knew he was free. If he would just believe that he was free, and take that first step towards freedom. This may sound like an odd illustration, but, but we're all like the possum. Running away, tangled in the netting of physical life. And when we're given the opportunity to be set free, we stall. And we still wait for an angry God to punish us, rather than walk in freedom. The Bible says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I've often heard the question asked, well, if God is all powerful, why doesn't he just save everybody? The answer is, he already has, if we believe it. So if you've done your homework, you've asked the questions, you can be free. Just believe and live. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the offer of life in abundance and life eternal through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I pray that you will convict the hearts of those unwilling to believe. Help them in their unbelief. I pray that if anyone is ready to believe and live, they do so at this very moment. And I pray that we will be all be willing to have the conversation for your great name's sake. Amen.
So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.